In this section we're going to show you how to install the MySQL Graphical Administrator on a Windows based system. In many environments you're likely to have back-end Linux or Unix type servers running MySQL but the front-end client may actually be one of the Windows operating systems such as XP or maybe even 2003 and as a result you should know how to install the graphical administrator as well as a query browser so in this section we look at the graphical administrator once complete we'll look at the query browser which allows us to function similar to the Microsoft SQL query analyzer utility in terms of executing queries and so forth but the graphical administrator allows us to tune parameters on the server and it also allows us to view how the server is currently behaving what's set and to update settings wherever possible so what we're going to do is our desktop in using full screen mode to our Windows 2003 host then we'll download the MySQL graphical administrator so we're going to launch our desktop we're going to go full screen and we'll set the number of colors to 16 bits or 65,535 colors and the hosts IP is 192.168.1.60 this will take us full screen behind the screen however is the Linux desktop the default users administrator and once we've logged in we'll have a clean desktop and we'll connect to the web using Firefox of course it takes a little bit to log in and again ideally you'll have or not necessarily ideally but in all likelihood you'll have Windows running on your desktop but MySQL backend databases that you'd like to manage so let's launch a browser we're going to navigate to dev.mysql.com and once we get there on the page we'll see where we'll be able to download or the links for downloading the MySQL graphical administrator now bear in mind we're connected at 800 by 600 resolution wherever possible increase the size of your resolution to be more effective such as 1280 by 1024 or even higher 1600 or the higher the better so here's the administrator and here's also the download for the query browser we're going to focus initially on the administrator so let's click on the generally available version and this graphical version is also available for Nix based systems providing you have certain requirements such as LiveGlade and so forth installed on the system so let's go ahead and click on the latest version 1.1 and you'll see the different downloads for Windows as well as for Nix based systems both RPM and non RPM packages there's also a download if any of your clients are running Mac OS who want to administer any of the MySQL DBMS's and there's also source files so in the event that you want to make modifications to some of the default paths on the system you can download the source files and compile it yourself but generally the RPM's the static RPM's are fine for most systems so let's go ahead and we'll just click on the download and this will download it optionally you can pick a mirror and pull it from a different mirror let's save this to disk and we'll have it momentarily it's done now it's an MSI file which means it's a quick installer let's pop it up and let's take a look at through an error let's see and this is for NT in version 2000 the older version so let's click on the pick a mirror and pull the one for x86 and below we should see mirrors that are available so we clicked on the older install which is based on, on NT4 in 2000 we'll go ahead and find a fast mirror such as Redwire or any one of the mirrors this particular mirror happens to be a quick mirror or at least from our vantage point it's a fast mirror so we'll download from there using HTTP and as you can see here it attempted to display the binary in the browser which was not the intended result so let's go back and try to get that again this time we'll do a save as right button save as to store the file directly on the drive let's save link as and we're gonna go ahead and try it from bizrate and this pops up nicely so let's save it to disk and just like that it's been downloaded so the older package the install msiw 
is for NT4 and 2000 based systems but the MSI package is natively supported in Windows 2003 so just go ahead and find the MSI and once you have it downloaded click on open and it pops up the wizard that you see here to perform the installation so we'll click on next and just click on accept now the administrator is licensed similar to the, rem the remaining MySQL programs under the GPL which means you can redistribute it and if you make changes to it you should simply recontribute it to the community but it is available under a GPL style license if in the event that within your environment you're concerned about licenses and how to deploy this particular utility especially considering that you may have multiple front-end users connecting to just a handful or a set of back-end MySQL DBMS's. If we go through the custom option you'll see the two different options that are available. One is the main program itself, the administrator. The other is the tray monitor which tells you whether or not the servers that you have in your connection lists are up or, or down. So it's a great way to monitor remote systems from your desktop. So it places a little tray program or a program in the system tray which will tell you similar to Microsoft's SQL tray utility which tells you whether or not the program SQL server that is is up and running of course when the server is connected to your local system. So let's close this out. We'll close the browser as well and now we have the program installed. Here are the two downloads. We can dump these administrators into the recycle bin plus the original program, the bad link that we clicked on and then we'll go to all programs and find that there's a new group created called MySQL which contains the system tray monitor if we click on it it'll attempt to load a system tray monitor and here it is and let's go back to all programs and in MySQL you'll see the actual administrator link which pops up with a nice GUI which enables us to connect to remote DBMS's. Now of course the permissions or security framework is all based on MySQL's security framework. So the client merely submits its credentials or whatever credentials you specify, username and password to a given host. So you need to ensure that the users that are defined on the remote system that you're attempting to connect to can actually connect from a remote system. That's very important. Otherwise, it'll be a waste of time. So let's attempt to connect. Now notice there's a stored connections area. And if you click on the ellipsis, you'll see that you can go ahead and define additional connections. We'll attempt to connect first and then save the connection after. Now we know that the host's IP that we've been working with is 192.168.1.50. This is the IP address for Linux CVT DB1. If name resolution is properly configured, go ahead and specify the name as well. Let's check it out by pinging Linux CVT DB1. And as you can see, it's attempting to resolve, but it doesn't know who it is. We can also try with the fully qualified name, such as dot internal, and now it resolves because it's using DNS. So we could specify the full name as well. Dot Linux CVT dot internal, fully qualified and once DNS is fine you should have no problems connecting. We'll specify a, a username of Linux CBT followed by a password of ABC123 which was originally set and then attempt to connect. Now, If you expand the details section you'll see some options that you may enable including whether or not you want the client to use compression. This is generally ideal even on local area networks with fast connectivity such as 100 or a gig. Whether or not to use SSL the client and the server needs to both support SSL in order for this to work so that connections between the administrator and the server go encrypted and use ANSI quotes to quote identifiers. Now it's attempting to connect and if it is able to connect momentarily it'll ask us to specify a default database. Notice it says access is denied for a certain user Linux CBT at the IP address we're using the password but it says it's denied. If we attempt to ping it returns positively because the system is pingable. It's reachable via ICMP. We'll stop pinging, click OK. We'll just confirm that we have the right password and then once we know that we've specified the correct password then all that remains of course is to check the server. But as it was obvious we had the wrong password, we specified it so that we could show you that the option to be able to ping the server to see whether or not it's alive is available. 
Now that ping differs from MySQL admin's ping. MySQL admin, the client utility that we've shown you from the Linux environment or from any Nix environment from the shell, will actually attempt to connect to the default port of 3306, whereas a ping uses ICMP or standard ICMP protocol to ping the server itself, but not necessarily MySQL running on the server. So great, we were able to connect, and now we see all sorts of useful information, which tells us that the user Linux CVT is able to connect from any host. So let's examine some of the information that's available to us. Notice on the left, this is the nav bar. We can navigate through different sections. And on the server information, which is the default category, you'll see that it says the server is running. And we have the ability whether or not we want to start or stop the server. But this only applies, if you notice, when you're connected to the local instance. So you can't, from the Windows client, at least not with the current version of the administrator, issue a stop across the wire to a remote server. So let's go back. Server information. If you click on running, all it does is it takes you to service control. But again, this relies upon the MySQL instance running locally on our local system, which happens to be the win box for the time being. It tells you the user who you're logged in as, which you know we've echoed via the prompt, the host name that we've connected to, and the port. It also tells you the version. It's 5018, and we're connecting using TCP IP and it tells you the network name if it knows it but in this case it doesn't so it tells you the IP address client information the client is listed as 5011 that's the client that we're running the network name Linux CBT Win 2 our local IP address which can all be confirmed host name for example returns Linux CBT Win 2 and an IP config all will return that it's dot sixty but it's obvious because we are desktop into it so this is our IP address being returned here it also knows the client operating system to be 2003 and it gives you hardware information in this case you can see the box is barely a 450 megahertz box with 160 megabytes of RAM so it's an old system but enough to run 2k3 so this is some basic information about the server that we're connected to as well as the client that we're connecting from which happens to be a win client now we briefly looked at service control. This is self-explanatory. If you are connected to a server locally from the client, so if the client and the server are on the same box, you'll be granted the, the ability providing you connect as a privileged user, in this case Linux CBT is a privileged user, you'd be granted the ability to stop the service as well as to start the service after you've stopped it. There's a configure service tab which contains additional fields such as whether or not to launch MySQL automatically, the display name, this is the display name for computer management, the description of the service, again this is after lo logging into computer management services. These are all Win specific features and features that are tied to the local instance of MySQL which currently isn't running. We have not installed MySQL locally. Let's look at some of the startup variables that are available for the remote system. Notice the section is only available when connected to local hosts. Let's move on to user administrator, or user administration that is. Notice below you see all of the users who are defined, and if you select a user, we're granted the ability to change certain attributes such as the password and to describe the user using full name, description, email, contact, and so forth. We can load icons from the disk. These are just images that are associated with a given user and a generic images presented for our use. But it tells us the user, it doesn't tell us the password, but it gives us the ability to change the password for the user because we are connected as a root user or as a privileged user. Now notice the apply changes and discard changes have illuminated. If we return to the defaults, unless you make a change, apply changes or discard changes will not illuminate. So if we were to change the user's password by simply removing one of the fields, or even both of the fields, now we may apply changes, or we can reset the user's password to a different value, or even the original value, and then apply changes. Discard changes is similar to a back in a browser, if you will, taking you back or undo in an application. Let's go to schema privileges. Here are the different schemas. Schemas are databases, and the terms are used interchangeably. 
if you click on any one of the databases that exist, such as HR, which, where we've done most work, you'll see whether or not the user has privileges to that particular schema. Here are all of the privileges that are available. We've gone through some of these, including select, insert, and so on, grant privileges, etc. These privileges we told you execute is required for executing stored, stored functions, which includes procedures and functions. These privileges can be assigned to the user by simply assigning to the left. So if we wanted to grant the user the alter routine privilege, we could, or even create view, we could just assign it to the user on the left, and this will assign the user that particular privilege. Otherwise, the user really has no privileges. We created this user with limited privileges. Let's go ahead and click Apply Changes. And now this particular user has been assigned an elevated privilege, the ability to create views, which is an, es an elevated privilege for the user. There's a search here where you can search for certain schemas. Let's say we have hundreds or thousands of schemas or databases. We could search. Show us just one schema which matches whatever we're searching for. So the search box allows us to do that. You can search within the schema data. And here are resources. You can limit users. These are all options that we could have sent via the command line to MySQL. We can limit the number of questions that the user may ask the server, the number of maximum updates, as well as the maximum number of connections. And these are the connections as well as updates and questions are all based on one hour. So for a given hour, if for some reason you have resource constraints, you could limit on a per user basis the questions they may ask, the amount of updates they may execute, and the number of connections they may make to the server. Because certainly the default is to permit an unlimited number of connections from users to the server, but you may want to restrict that capability. We've moved on to the Linux CBT user and schema privileges are listed. We pick any one of the schemas, you'll see whatever is granted. And if you expand the schema, you'll see per table privileges as well, which apply. You can grant privileges globally, as you know, through the user table within the MySQL database. You may also grant privileges at a database level, the table level, and even the column level. Here are all the privileges that apply at the various levels of the hierarchy from the global level all the way down to the column level. Super. And here are the additional users, the replica user and the root user, of course. Notice there are two root users. When one user is represented twice, you'll notice that two hosts or n number of hosts are represented so that you can alternate between the two different users. One master name allowed to log in from two various hosts, one being local and the other being Linux CBT DB1, although they're all one and the same. So let's continue exploring the MySQL administrator. Again, as mentioned, this administrator is available, available for Nix and Windows based systems. So that's good to keep in mind in the event that you want to offer this utility to a mix or heterogeneous user community set. So as you know from the user administration area you may select a user and assign privileges as necessary. There are schema privileges, there's basic user information which includes username and password which of course represents the most important piece of information used by MySQL to grant or deny access. This is all being extracted by the way from the user table or the MySQL user table. Certainly good to keep in mind. That actually helps to, while actually exploring this administration interface, to use a utility that permits us access to the server so we can compare from a shell basis to the graphical tool. So it's good to compare and contrast. So let's just download the PuTTY utility. This is a utility that will allow us, it's an SSH client, to connect to the MySQL server. We just simply need the PuTTY SSH utility and we'll find the one that runs on our current version. There's a setup utility that installs everything for us as well. We could download that as well. Let's find the installer and here it is version 058. We'll download it and just run it very quickly. Let's click on open. And again we want to just compare and contrast 
between the graphical and shell-based clients and between the two environments, Linux and Windows. We'll create an icon on the desktop as well as a quick launch icon and we'll have this momentarily. So another way to offer administrative capabilities to your Windows based users is to give them a shell based client such as PuTTY for connecting to the remote system but with a graphical tool such as the administrator it may not even be necessary. We'll connect to 192.168.1.50 or simply the fully qualified name of Linux CBT DB1 Linux CBT .internal. We'll save this particular session using the same name and then attempt to connect. And it should pop up momentarily asking us for the to accept the public key of the remote system and we'll log in as the user Linux CBT. And now we have a shell interface to the same server that the administrative tool is connected to. So let's launch my SQL user root prompt for password and then we'll connect so we're in we know that we're in we've customized the prompt nothing new is happening here however with respect to users as you know the users you see on the left can be revealed by executing a select user comma host comma password from mysql.user and you'll see that the same set of users exists as mentioned, the reason why the root user appears with two hosts beneath it's because the user root is unique, so this is a group by. The name is unique, but the hosts differ, whereas the other users are unique for any host. So you can't have any duplication with the users Linux CBT, Latte 2, or Replica because they apply to any number of hosts, which explains why the graphical administrator utility lists these users without hosts so that's something to keep in mind as well when you see users without hosts that means the user can log in from any host which may or may not be what you want in your environment and again as you know from the shell if we execute a show grant for a given user let's take a user such as replica for example it'll reveal the positions or the permissions that is that are assigned to the user. So in this case, the permission assigned to the user replica that is includes select reload super and the important permission of replication slave on to permit replication to the slave systems that use replica for replication. Excellent. So you get you understand a little bit about what's happening there, how they pair up one to one and so forth. The user isn't limited, but we could go ahead and limit the privileges and the maximum connections, questions, as well as updates for the user. But we've mentioned that and it is unnecessary. Excellent. So let's move forward. We want to look at the server connections area. This shows the total number of connections available. This is equivalent to show process lists. So from the shell, let's go ahead and execute a show process list. And we missed the OW, running the command as if it's a Cisco device. And here are the connections. There are four connections according to the SQL output, MySQL output, including two for the replica user, one, of course, for the I.O. process, the other being for the bin log process, which is responsible for dumping the binary. In fact, this is the service of both processes are bin log dump processes because there are two slave servers out there. On the slave server, you have the I.O. and SQL processes. So these are bin log processes. And here are the additional users. So let's look at the list of users that you see here. Here are the four users with their connection IDs of 2, 3, 5, and 7. Let's confirm that that is what is the case on from the MySQL server's perspective. And it is the case. Connection ID is 2, 3, 5, as well as 7. So again, the information is being represented accurately. The two bin log dump processes, again, are for the two slaves that are out there. You can see the state, and by using the graphical tool, you can more accurately get a snapshot at any point in time of the state of the replication-related processes, whereas with the shell-based utility, you would constantly have to rerun the query show process list quite often to get the snapshot information. With the graphical tool, 
you'll see the state by just simply clicking on refresh quite often. One, you'll see the time increase. Two, you'll see the state change if the state does indeed change while you're within the tool. So that's pretty straightforward. So here are the users and their states, the commands, the DBs they're connected to. Linux CBT in this case is connected to MySQL and so forth. Here are the user connections. Root Linux CBT replica. This is a different view. It shows the user and the threads. So in one pane is the user and then the pane immediately following are the threads opened by that particular user. Linux CBT has the MySQL DB open and that should be obvious because in order to reveal the information that you see here you must query the process or run the equivalent of the process list which checks the MySQL DB. Replica has two processes open and root is just connected at localhost and that's this particular connection that we have open currently doing nothing and not in a default database either notice that it says none we could go ahead and switch to to the HR context or schema and if we refresh you'll find that the DB that the root user is currently in is HR so it's updated once you click refresh it's not being updated dynamically but if you click refresh it does. We could also kill the connection. Let's go ahead and try to kill this user root and what you'll see is that the client will attempt to reestablish a connection. So it doesn't kill it permanently. Notice it says trying to reconnect because the MySQL client by default automatically attempts to reconnect to the server upon receiving a kill signal. So in this case it's been granted a new connection ID. It was formerly 7 it's now 8. So the client reconnected immediately. So the 7 that you see here is no longer legit or no longer the case. If we click refresh, now the connection's 8. We can go ahead and kill the user again. Or we have the ability to kill the thread, which we've shown you earlier on. So you can kill user or kill thread. Let's try to do something again, such as show databases. And you'll see that the client will report that it lost its connection and then was granted connection number 9 great so this works just like within the shell environment let's move on to the other useful information we have a health category this graphically displays information related to CPU usage connection usage the number of queries as well as the amount of traffic that the server is receiving and sending so if you want to get a sense for how your systems performing from these perspectives these metrics connections currently there are five connections which is by no means high traffic, the amount of network traffic in use, while well, the server is connected at a gigabit or using a gigabit interface at a gigabit speed. So 3.6K is a very tiny fraction of a gigabit, so we have nothing to worry about network-wise or bandwidth-wise. So this is the least of our concerns. The number of SQL queries, however, is more CPU intensive and memory intensive than the other two metrics, which include connection usage and traffic. So you want to watch a number of, number of SQL queries within a production environment. But in order to know what's unusual or abnormal, you'll have to define or develop and define baselines for performance during normal usage. So per server, you'll need to defi divine, define your baselines and use those baselines to compare to any snapshot in time to be able to determine if the connection is considered to be abnormal at that point in time. So baseline development is very important. Let's move on to memory health. Query cache hit rate. The higher this is the better, which tells us that memory is being utilized efficiently and queries are hitting what's in memory. So this is an important metric. The higher the better. But of course we have a low utilization environment so we're unable to tell anything based on this information. The key buffer usage. The key buffer usage is usually or the key buffer value is usually set very low in a default environment. It's usually something like 8 megabytes. On a system such as ours where we have half a gigabyte available we can confirm it of course by quitting this session or executing it from the shell either or we could let's just do for example an escape shebang followed by a free and you'll see that this system has about 512 megs of memory so it's a pretty capable system 
on a system with 512 megs of memory you'll want to increase the key buffer memory to something much much higher per 256 the suggestion is at least 64 so we should be setting a good 128 megabytes for key buffer usage to increase the amount of memory that MySQL has available for storing its caches, index hits, and so forth. There are status variables, all sorts of status variables. We won't go through all of these, but for example, here's some general statistics. The number of files open, the number of tables that are open. These are usually defaults based on maybe one or two connections, which includes replication. The open tables, the number of questions being asked. Of course, since replication is up and running, questions are always being asked by the two slaves that are out there. The uptime in number of seconds. Threads, now this server hasn't been shut in a while, so it's been up for a good while. Threads, here are the threads that are connected and created and running. There are three that are currently running. Temporary usage, which is the default temp location on the system. There are performance metrics such as slow launch threads, slow queries. We discussed the slow query log, and we currently have it up and running. None of our queries, by the way, are taking longer than the slow query long t or the long query time to run, which is 10 seconds by default. So we're unlikely to see a value other than zero for slow queries unless we reduce the query long value to force it to increase. And there are all sorts of other metrics that you may want to take a look at to get a sense but they basically fall under the categories of general performance networking commands executed and there's even a breakdown within the commands executed of DDL versus DML versus show versus replication it's pretty granular so for those of you who are interested network traffic you can see the bytes sent bytes received how much of it replication the commands executed DDL commands, these are all D DDL commands. You know DDL commands include drop, create, alter, and so forth. So here are the alter DBs, alter tables. If we're to go ahead and alter a table, for example, this value will increase. DMLs include select, insert, update, delete, and transactional commands such as commit, rollback. There are show commands which show running variables on the servers. Notice five show databases were executed. And you may be wondering where are all these values coming from. If you think about it, the graphical client in its effort to present to us useful information executes commands on our behalf. So the graphical client really submits to the MySQL server SQL commands to return the values that are presented in this nice graphical output which explains why the number of show databases is 5 and 58 for fields and so forth because the graphical tool is submitting commands under the hood to make this all work replication related information slave starts slave stops master data and so forth there's a miscellaneous section for information or metrics that don't fall under the general categories of performance commands executed networking and general. These are the main categories and these are collapsible and expandable as well. There are system variables for similar categories including general, connections, SQL, memory, table types, and so forth. We've defaulted of course to my ISAM so you shouldn't really see any tables for InnoDB although there is support for InnoDB but you can tell from the graphical tool whether or not there's support and what the metrics or what the values are that are permitted for these different DBs. Notice Berkeley DB support is not enabled. We didn't, or the binary file didn't find, if it supports Berkeley DBs by default, didn't find any Berkeley DB libraries upon installation, which as a result caused it to not provide Berkeley DB support. But if you have the need for Berkeley DB support, let's say for other applications such as SendMail, you'll need to ensure that the Berkeley DB development package is installed prior to installing MySQL so that when MySQL installs it finds it and provides support for it. And here are new variables and so forth. Let's move on to server logs. The server logs require that you have administrative access to the server. First and foremost when you're running the client from a WinBox or from it or a Linux box 
in order to gain access to the logs you need local access which is why you're not seeing the logs here because we're connected remotely we're unable to query the logs the utility literally queries the file system if you're on Windows it knows where to search if you're on Linux it also knows where to search which of course defaults to and we'll quit the session and go to var live mysql this is the default location so if you're running this client from Linux it defaults to this directory including the error log file slow log if defined normal log and so forth or in this case the query log and so forth or binary logs etc we're not connected locally to the server they're not one in the same so you're not going to see log related information but all that's displayed anyway just for your edification includes the events so it's parsed by time log entry and so forth and content so these two panes display the entries inside each of the log files the error log file being of course the file that terminates in .err that should be obvious the slow log file being the file which contains slow in it will grep slow and you'll see that the slow log file is this particular file and by the way it has 278 bytes let's go ahead and paste that and we don't have permissions we'll su in and try that again so let's cat the 278 bytes and these are just defaults for the server starting up the 278 bytes are really there have been no queries that have executed longer than the allowed time which is 10 seconds and general log stores the query log this is the basic log as you know the query log we do have defined as a file name prefix with the host name followed by simply dot log for all queries that's run but again it may be more useful to look at this information from the Linux side by simply executing a watch followed by a tail and the name of the log file this will show you all new entries the commands that you see run here are all being run by the administrator so as we navigate through the administrator this file will be updated so we can go somewhere else and take a look at different variables and just watch the queries run let's go to user administration pick a user pick a schema assign a privilege none of these are being changed however but now when you do apply changes look at all of the queries that were run as a result all being submitted by the client and then after the client the, the win client submits the changes it returns to a few set of queries including show global status and show in ODB status to return basic information on a recurring basis within the tool so let's move on past server logs you have replication status replication status tells you what's happening with replication first and foremost it knows the ID it knows the host it also knows the port and the fact that this server is a master and it tells you that the status is currently new instance so it's up and running it tells you where the log file is and it tells you the log position so another way to set up replication on slaves is to use this utility and just extract the current log file which is 0008 or terminating with 8 followed by a position of 6683 this information that you see here again is equivalent to running a show master status from the MySQL shell let's go in again and once within MySQL if you recall a show master status reveals the same information the name of the log file and the position well that's what's returned here but the MySQL administrator simply adds some other useful columns including the host name as well as the ID which is the server ID that's set in etc my.cnf so those are some things to keep in mind as to where this information is coming from you can add an instance to the monitoring list and this particular instance will now be monitored so from your windows box you can monitor an instance out there a master for example and as you connect to other slaves within your environment you can add them to the monitoring list now the monitor occurs in the system tray so that when you close the administrator you can see what's happening with your masters and slaves and if there are any problems but perhaps a better way to monitor servers would be to use a third party tool to recurringly such as what's up gold or a similar tool to on a recurring basis monitor the ports that should be available across the network on the demons that you are managing there's a backup tab which allows us to create a new project and in that new project we can specify which databases to be backed up there are advanced options including whether or not in ODB should be backed up online whether or not you want the tables to be locked because you may 
not want changes to be made, we've shown you how to run the flush read locks when we took a snapshot of the database, HR for example. Bin log position, if you want a position to be backed up, or just want a normal backup, a complete backup. This is all built into the administrator, but perhaps for your enterprise environment you want to use a or an enterprise type solution such as backup exec for backing up your MySQL DBs. The enterprise backup programs out there do support MySQL and as a result you should consider those but at least there's a facility built in similar to other SQL type managers such as Enterprise Manager for Microsoft SQL to perform backups from the utility rather than having to rely upon a third party program. Once you have your project defined and all the options set including a schedule if that's what you want then you go ahead and you save the project and once the project saved you can go ahead and execute the backup and this will cause the backup to run but you'll need to specify what should occur what the settings are whether it's normal complete if the table should be locked the schedule and where the files should be saved in this case it'll be saved locally so the administrator will back up from the remote and dump back up to the local system we'll have to of course specify a location but it is possible and we can execute it now or have it run on a schedule so again when we clicked on it notice it says you must enable the password storage option so that the password is saved so that when the backup goes to run at a given time it submits the proper credentials and after you've backed up the system n number of times there's a restore option you can click on restore to undo or to restore the backups that you've made and finally there's a catalog section the catalog section allows you to interact with each of the schemas that are defined. Each of these schemas are really the databases and their descriptions. These are the field names as well as the field types as we've defined them. So for example for the HR database here are the different tables and their structures. If you drill down on each by double clicking you'll see the details or the schema related information you'll see all of the columns and their data types which can be changed by the way but you know how to do this all from the shell so when you see it within the graphical environment it becomes much much easier to understand you also see which keys are primary whether or not they accept nulls whether or not they're auto incremented you can turn this on or off the default value when you do turn on an auto incremented field is to be null by the way and we've mentioned that often and these are just basically the different flags that can be set for the different field types. If a field is a primary key, you see the golden key indicating that it is a primary key. Otherwise, for typical fields that are not primary keys, they show up using the bullets that you see here, followed by their data types. If it's a date type field, such as date, timestamp, date time, you'll see what appears to be a little cal calendar right next to the icon. Whereas for normal text, it looks just like a text page whereas if it's an integer or some sort of field that can perform calculations you'll see a little calculator icon these are just icons which are all subject to change to help you differentiate rather quickly visually the type of fields that are defined within the table and you can modify the, t the table options such as the storage engine for example you know that the default is my ISAM you also know the default character set is Latin 1 and the collation is Latin 1 Swedish. All of this can be changed on a per table basis. You may move from one storage engine to another supported storage engine all while within the administrator. And there are many other options that you should explore that you can affect by using the MySQL administrator. But the catalog section allows you to interact with the DBs, their tables, and their columns. Additionally, here are schema indices. This is a shortcut view into the indices or indexes that are defined within a given schema across all tables. For example, for the employees table, it tells you which particular field is considered to be the index. You may have up to 16 indexes, as you know, per table. In this case, only one column or one field is defined as an index for the employees table. The pay scale table has two. One is ID, the other is salaries. The salaries table has one called salaries. So this is a shortcut to seeing which indexes are defined or indices are defined for your different tables within the database. Here are the views. We have one view defined and it's called employee lists. You may edit the view 
and see how it's created, modify it, you may even execute it to see what happens, and so forth. But this is the view definition. You can drop the view, and you can create an entirely new view, and so forth. But we're going to show you how to affect these sorts of structural changes using the query browser rather than the administrator, but some limited modifications are permitted using the general administrated MySQL administrative tool. Here are stored procedures. It should be better termed as stored routines because this section covers functions. Notice the SF that we define, SF agent years, as well as all of the stored procedures that we define. So really this area should be called stored routines because it encompasses functions as well as procedures. And again, you may modify the routine and here it is create function it expects a date and it performs a date diff from the current date to the date specified and returns an integer or in this case it might be a decimal let's edit store procedure it returns a decimal six six in length with three after the decimal point and we can create new store procedures giving it a name and simply inserting the SQL syntax that permits the execution of the query. But again, my preference is to use not the graphic util utility but the MySQL terminal monitor because it just feels more natural. But in the real world, you're likely to have Windows on the desktop and this tool is formidable and allows you to administer your servers however spread out they are. So next we're going to look at the query browser to show you some of the ways you can use it to perform queries and to manipulate some of the database objects including indices, views, stored routines which includes functions as well as procedures and to do other things. You won't find backup and restore and replication status in the query browser but you will find catalogs and you'll find objects that are stored within your catalogs and you'll be able to manipulate them as a result. So next we look at the query browser.